looking at the first few chapters of Genesis. And it happened, uh, actually, the Zoo had a special exhibit over a holiday weekend. Uh, and all the birds could go to the house and see all the creepy things that I don't like to look at. You still could go to all this. But on this particular weekend, they had a special exhibit. It was called Humans. And you would walk up to this exhibit, and there was a sign that cautioned humans in their natural habitat. And there were eight participants, uh, eight men and women, that actually uh, were part of a lottery to be part of this exhibit. And you could walk by, and you could see them lying on rocks and sunbathing. You could see them playing games. You could see them lounging in furniture. And people would walk by and see these humans in the zoo. The, the zoo spokeswoman, her name was uh, Polly Wills, she said this, she said, seeing people in this environment among other animals teaches members of the public that the humans are just another animal. Tom Mahoney, who was one of the participants in this, said, a lot of people think humans are above other animals. When they see humans as animals, it kind of reminds us that we're not that special. Now, a spokesperson for the zoo and a participant in this uh, exhibit, quote unquote exhibit, said one thing, but their actions denied what they said was true. Because it wasn't a zebra that built a cage and put humans in there. The lion didn't come along and pound up a sign that said humans in their natural habitat. Even though these humans that were in this exhibit had caretakers through the day, at the end of the day, each of the participants were allowed to go home and come back the next morning. I don't think the zoo did that for the giraffes. So even though they said one thing, their actions betrayed what they said was true. And the reality is that as humanity is different than all the other animals. That's why it was overheard as children were walking past this human exhibit. They were laughing and they said to their parents, why are people in cages? Because children instinctively knew that humans don't belong in a cage. Now, don't get me wrong. Humans are interesting to look at. Okay, That's why my wife and I, when we went on our cruise, there were many times we just sat down and we just people watched. And we watched all these people walk by because people are interesting to look at. But the truth is that we are different than the rest of creation. And the problem that we're seeing in our culture and in our society is reflected in these words here, where humanity is being undervalued. And as a result, life becomes cheap and sometimes even meaningless. But as we are going to see here in Genesis chapter 1, that's not the way God intended it. And what I want you to see today is the truth that we're going to see in these few verses is that our identification is the result of God's declaration. You see, who we are as humans, who we are as people, as a res is just simply a result of what God declared it to be. Now, I started this series from the start last week. And if you were here last week, and if not, just to kind of bring you up to speed, uh, one of the reasons we're doing this series is because uh, many of the huge fundamental questions that every worldview has to answer, such as why is there something when, there's, when there should be nothing? Why, why are we in existence? Why are we living in the world that we're living in today? All of these, all of these questions have to be answered by every single worldview. And it's Genesis that actually answers this question for us as Bible-believing Christians. It's in Genesis that, that really helps give the framework for theology and history and humanity and sin and even salvation itself. And if you were here last week, we started in Genesis chapter 1, and it was in Genesis chapter 1 that I showed you that creation is God's explanation. It's creation that explains the distinctiveness of God. It's creation that explains why the world operates the way it does. It's creation that explains who you and I are even today. And our identification today is the result of God's declaration. 
God declared that you and I were to be different than the rest of creation. We are to be unique. And, and as we're going to see here in our text this morning, that, that it's, it, we are created distinctively and uniquely from the rest of creation. And how we view our existence influences how we see ourselves. It influences how we see others. It influences our relationships. It influences even our salvation. It all comes back to how we see God created each and every one of us. Our identification is the result of God's declaration. So Genesis chapter 1 is the beginning of time. It's the beginning of creation. It's the first seven days of of the history of the universe. And it's there, if you remember, in in the first three days, God formed the earth. The earth was formless and empty. In the first three days, God formed the earth. The second three days, God filled the earth, and he filled it with animals, and he filled it with plants, and he filled it with stars, and and the sun, and the moon. And then if you have Genesis open, it's very easy to find. It's, you know, like the second or third page of your Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verse 24, it tells us this, and God said, This is the sixth day of creation. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And what we see here, is God has now formed and filled the entire earth for his ultimate creation. And what we're going to discover here, that now it's ready. The world is now ready for the creation of humankind. What we're going to see here in these three verses is that our identification is the result of God's Declaration. And what we see, first of all, is God's intention for humanity. So in verse 24, he ends, it ends by telling us that he had created all the land animals and all the creeping things on the ground, everything that lives on the dry ground, God created. Then, this is must be, you know, later on on the sixth day, then God said, Let us. Not lettuce. He wasn't making lettuce. Lettuce had already been created. But this, but he's saying, let us. Now, now we pause here because the, the narrative begins to slow down for us when it talks about the intention for humanity. The, the narrative, the, 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 the voice, is, it changes. It's no longer third person, but now it's first person. And, and God is saying, let us. And when we look at those two words, there's been a lot of conversation about what was being said there in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And I would say to you, I would propose to you that what we see here in Genesis 1, 26 is the beginning of a revelation of the tri-unity of God. And what God is doing here is he's speaking with himself. And I have a little diagram here. You can see the Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. All three persons of the Trinity are God, but the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father. Now, your brain probably starts to hurt when you think about this too long. It's one God with three distinct persons that make up this triune Godhead. And it's here in the very beginning that we see this deliberation with God himself, where he's saying, let us make God, or let us make man in our image. Now, some people try to deny the triunity of God, and they would say that in verse 26, when it says, let us, that it's God speaking to the angels, that he's saying to the angels, let us make man in our image image. Now, that probably fails to understand because why would God need to consult with any other created being about what he was about to do? Some people think, some people deny the Trinity here, and they say, well, what is being said is God was using the the plural of majesty. 
where royalty never refers to themselves as I or me. Queen Victoria is famously known as saying, we are not amused. And, and she was speaking about herself, but it was what we call the plural of majesty. But I think what God is revealing to us here is the very first instance of the Trinity, the triunity of the God that we serve. Now, we don't understand the Trinity from the plain, literal reading of Genesis chapter 1. However, we are not people who don't have the New Testament. We're not people who don't have the benefit of time and future revelation about this text in Genesis chapter 1. Because when you come to John chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3, it tells us this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things have been created by him, and, and everything that has been created has been created by him. And that's reference to God the Son. And so even back in Genesis, John is telling us in his gospel, there was God the Father who was there at creation, but God the Son was at creation. And we know already from earlier in, in Genesis chapter 1 that the Spirit of God was hovering over the earth at this point. And so there we see a great revelation of the triunity of our God. And so God, in deliberate, divine conversation, he says, let us. And what is it that he's saying? He says, if we go on here, he says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now, again, there's a lot of conversation. What did he mean there? It's, it's very obvious that, that this creation, this creature that God is about to create is different from everything else. Because here he's saying it's going to be distinct. It's going to be unique. This creature that he's about to create is going to be in his likeness. Does that mean physically we look like God? Well, no, because God isn't a physical being. He doesn't have arms. He doesn't have fingers. He doesn't have a nose or ears or anything like that. And there's other things in creation that have noses and ears and, and elbows and feet and things like that. And so, so it can't be that. And so typically how we would understand this is that God was referring to something that is not physical. And oftentimes we think that you know, we have some of those characteristics that God possesses. Such so We have the capacity to love, just like God loves. We have the capacity to, to, to have conscious self-awareness about ourselves. We have the capacity to make things. We have the capacity to, to be good. That, that we have these capacities within ourselves that also God has in himself. But I really like the way Paul Tripp defines this this uh, image of God. And he, he really boils it down to three words. He said, first of all, we are receivers. So God has the ability to communicate with us and as his creation that's created in his likeness, that we have the ability to receive his message, to receive his words, that we're conscious of what God says to us unlike anything else in creation. So we're receivers, also we're interpreters. That as we receive this communication from God, that it's us, opposed to all the rest of the animals of creation, that it's us that has the ability to interpret and understand what God is trying to communicate to us. And then he says, thirdly, we are worshipers. That it's us and us alone in all the physical created world, it's only us that has the capacity to consciously worship him. I told you last week, you look at a platypus and that platypus very clearly demonstrates the glory of God. But that platypus can never consciously worship its creator. And so here God says, let us, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And what we see here is God's, or our identification is the result of God's declaration. Because he goes on and he says, let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the livestock and over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. That's what God intended. Listen, we are not the result of, 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 of an evolutionary process. 
were not the result of some cosmic coincidence, that we were created with intentionality. God intended to make man in his image. So we see the intention of God's intention for humanity. But secondly, if we go on here, we see God's creation of humanity. That, that he, he, we are, in fact, creatures. We're creatures that have been created by God. It's important for us to understand that, that we are not self, we're, we're not self-existent that we were created by, by God himself, that, that we are not autonomous in and of ourselves, that we are creatures who were created. And it's very clear to us in the very next verse, the intentionality in God's creation of us. In verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, if you were to look at that verse and you were to explain it to a first grader, what is God trying to tell us in verse number 27? He created us. Three different times in that verse, it says that God created us. Now, I told you last week that word created there is only used in the Old Testament only of God. Because God's the only one who can actually create. We, we all make things out of what God has created. It's God who created. It's, so it tells us God created man. He created him. Male and female, he created them. There is intentionality here. And you can read through here and see that this creation was to be different. This creature that he was, he was creating was to be distinct from the rest of creation. Because it's nowhere else in the creation of the world did it say that he created it. He commanded the dry ground to produce vegetation. He, he called the, the, the dry ground to produce livestock and, and wild animals. But it's here, it says that he created man in his own image. And then he says something that I'm going to address that maybe is going to cause me to be canceled in our culture. If you look at the end of this verse, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God says there were only two genders, two sexes that he created. He created the male and female. And listen, what I'm about to say, I don't, I don't want this to be said condescendingly or condemningly. I want this to be said with compassion. And the fact that today I am, we live in a culture where we have, our culture has separated the difference between sex and gender where you may be born a certain sex, but your gender is how you identify yourself or, or how you perceive yourself. And so uh, in our culture, I, we would say, you know, I'm a male today, not because I was born a male, but because today I perceive myself to be a male. If tomorrow I perceive myself to be a female, then I'm no longer a male, but now I'm a female. Because we've, we've blurred the lines here. There's, there's confusion in what's going on here. And I say this with deep compassion for this reason. Because the moment we, ent we, we introduce disorder into what God has ordered, it brings about great moral harm and injury to the people around us. God ordered it a particular way. And the reason, another reason I say this with deep compassion is this is because when we separate ourselves and when we fail to understand that we are unique creations of a divine God, we're going to start to identify with everything else. Because God has created us in such a way to, to find our identification somewhere. And, and God intended for us to find our identification in the fact that he created us, that we are the image bearers. We're to be the reflectors of, of God's image in the world around us. And when we lose sight of that, we're going to start to identify 
by skin color, by, by racial backgrounds, by genders, by sexuality. We're going to start to identify with all these other things because we've lost sight of the fact that we are identified as creations of God. And our identification is the result of God's declaration. And if God created, God owns us, right? If you create something, by, by nature of you creating it, you own it. I remember several years ago, my son and I were playing a game, and it was a game that he made up. And so I started to win the game, and then all of a sudden, he changed the rules on me. And I said, well, you, you just changed the rules. And he said, well, Dad, it's my game, and I can change the rules. And so by, by just the fact of being creator, he's the one who makes the rules. And today, if you're here and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. And he, he bought you as a ransom to himself. And so by that, he has the right to define who we are. He has the right. He owns my personhood. He owns my sexuality. He owns all that I possess by way of creator, but ultimately by way of redeemer. And our identification is the result of God's declaration. But go on here. And what we see here next is the instruct, God's instruction to humanity. Verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, again, this is different than what he said to anything else in creation. Nowhere else in creation did he say he blessed the wild animals or he blessed the, 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 animal, the creepy, crawly animals on the ground. Here it says that God blessed them and said to them. Nowhere else in creation did God speak to the creation. And here's what he said. Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Here in this command, this instruction that he gives to humanity, it's really twofold. First of all, he says, be fruitful and increase in number. He intended for humanity to multiply and to procreate and to, to increase in numbers on the face of the earth. Again, we're facing a time in our culture where there's people who are telling us that the world is in trouble because there's too many people. That, that somehow that if we have, continue to have more and more people, that it's harmful to the world. That, that flies in the face of what God has instructed us to do. He said, be fruitful and increase. And I would say to you that what we're seeing in a lot of places in a lot of developed worlds is the, the, the results, the damaging results of not fulfilling this command. Did you know that in Japan today, one third of the entire population is 65 years or older? And to compound that issue, there's a low birth rate, like people are not having babies in Japan. And as a result, as the culture is getting older, there's less and less young people to take care of the older people. And in Japan, they're actually developing robots to work in nursing homes because they can't find the staff to work there. And they anticipate just within three years, in two, by 2025, Japan will have a nursing shortage of over 330,000 nurses. God said, I want you to be fruitful and increase in number because it's good. But then he goes on, he gives a second part to this command, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth and subdue it. Some people think that this is a continuation of the previous command, that we are to increase in number and fill the earth. I think it's a, it's a different command. He's already said, be fruitful and increase, and now he moves on to a different command. And what I want you to do is fill the earth and subdue it. So on one hand, he says, I want you to increase through procreation, and I want you to fill the earth through construction and, and development. And he intended for humanity to, to be in his image and to, to make things and to fill the earth with buildings and farms and, and, and cultures and, and, and communities that he intended for humanity to do that. And ultimately then to subdue creation. So we're to fill the earth just as God filled the earth. We're to form the earth just as God formed the earth because we are made in his likeness. And then he goes on, he says, rule over, 
rule over the birds of the, the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. That command is why we put animals in zoos and farms and freezers and it's not the other way around. That's why we're not to elevate anything else in creation to the same level as humanity. Because God has instructed humanity from the very start that you are created in my likeness, in my image. You are to be my image bearers. You're to reflect my image to all of creation. You're to multiply and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the rest of creation. And so because of that great truth, it's important for us to understand this. So what should we do here? And I would say to you, the very simple application from what I read in these three verses is just simply be human. Just just be human. It's in this narrative that humanity was the pinnacle of all of creation. Humanity was unlike anything else that God had created previously in those six days. And for that reason, because we are created in the image of God, even today on the other side of the fall of humanity, even though it's somewhat marred, we still all carry with us the image and the likeness of God. Everyone that you come eye to eye with this week are people who are created in the image and the likeness of God. So be human. Everyone. Everyone. Everyone you agree with, everyone you disagree with, everyone deserves your dignity and your honor and your respect. Because that person you come eye to eye with is created in the image and likeness of God just as you and I were. And you see, when we dishonor another person, we dishonor God. When we perpetrate violence upon another person, we're perpetrating violence against God. When we reject another person, we're rejecting God. When we abuse or misuse or objectify another person, it is in stark violation to the character of God himself. So be human. Because God declared that we are made in his likeness and his image. So be human because our identification is the result of God's declaration. The new atheists would tell you today that you're just a prisoner of your DNA. DNA. That that you're just who you are by, by some cosmic coincidence. You're just who you are by evolution. There's nothing special about you. But from the start, God said that this creature that I'm going to create They are going to be in my image and in my likeness, and they are my prized creation. So much so that even when that creation that he had created rejected him, he didn't just give up. That he began to work from that moment forward to bring redemption and reconciliation to the relationship that was harmed because of the disorder that was introduced into creation the moment man and woman sinned. So why do you matter? Because God declared it so. Why does your neighbor matter? Because God declared it to be so. Why do all lives matter? Because God declared it to be so. I don't, it doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter your ethnicity. It doesn't matter your socioeconomic background. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. You matter to God because he declared it to be so. If you were to reach into your wallet and you pull out a $100 bill and a $1 bill, Does it matter where those bills have been? 
It doesn't matter how those bills have been used. It doesn't matter. And if you look at those two bills, they look almost identical. But why is a $100 bill more valuable than a $1 bill? Because a $100 bill carries the image of Benjamin Franklin. And a $1 bill carries the image of George Washington. You are valuable because you bear the image of God. Every child, every friend, every coworker, every neighbor is valuable because they bear the image of God. So be human because our identification is the result of God's declaration. Father, we thank you today for your word. I thank you for the ways in which it speaks to us and thank you that from the very start, you have declared who we are. And so I pray, I pray that we would be able to leave here today and that as we come eye to eye with people this week, that we would see them. We would see past whatever differences that we have, whatever whatever's going on in their lives, that we'd be able to see past that and just see people around us as people who are made in the image of God. And so we thank you. Uh, we thank you for the way in which you have created us. Thank you for the ways in which you have defined and, and displayed your glory in our lives. And so as we leave here, may we, we be able to praise you for who you are and who we are in relationship to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.